And without much ado, let me pass on the virtual stage to Ina Hajrini, the uh, moderator today. And uh, Ina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, hi everyone, and special thanks to our organizers, Raphael Schoenle and Dominic Smith. Uh, for today's session, we have two very interesting topics lined up. Our first topic is on consumption categories, household attention, and inflation expectations, implications for optimal monetary policy. And the second topic is on inflation expectations and the misallocation of resources, evidence from Italy. Before we get started, let me touch just a little bit on a couple of pointers on today's format. So we're going to have two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each, followed by a Q&A session of 10 to 15 minutes at the very end. Attendees, unfortunately, do not have the option to switch on their audio or video, but are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. They can, of course, pose their questions during the presentations um, and do not have to wait until the, until the very end. I will then select questions to be answered after the presentations in the Q&A session. Uh, the webinar will be live streamed via the Sebra YouTube channel. It will also be recorded and made available on the Sebra website, as well as the Sebra YouTube channel after the event. Uh, without much further ado, I'd like to invite to our virtual stage, our first speaker for today, Alexander Dietrich, who is a PhD candidate of economics at University of Tübingen, and will speak about um, consumption categories, household attention, and inflation expectations, implications for optimal monetary policy. Alexander, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much for, for having me today for this uh, presentation. Um, so in my paper, the basic question that I ask is, what is the, the optimal inflation measure that a central bank should try to target? Um, as we all know, most central banks have a price stability mandate. That is, they have a legal mandate to keep prices stable over time in the economy. But which prices actually, that is, which goods and services should the central bank look at when it thinks about stabilizing inflation rates? What is the optimal measure um, that the central bank should target with its normal interest rate instrument? And so far, the new Keynesian perspective on that question um, was um, that the central bank optimally only targets the core inflation rate. That is uh, a narrowly defined concept of inflation that excludes the most volatile components, food and energy prices. And the reason really for this argument is that food and energy prices have only small normal rigidities, and therefore um, the central bank is just more efficient in stabilizing the economy if it excludes those prices um, that are very flexible in their pricing from the inflation target. Yet in my paper, I'm taking a somewhat different stance. I'm arguing that um, monetary policy should optimally target the headline inflation rate because of the very important role that food and energy prices play for households and especially households uh, inflation expectations formation. Um, in the paper, I will first provide new micro evidence on consumer expectations. First, uh, using a survey on, on inflation expectations that I um, design and that is uh, sponsored by the Cleveland Fed. And in that survey, I show that um, US consumers disproportionately focus on food and energy components of their consumption basket when they form their inflation expectations. And this pattern, this disproportionate um, emphasis on food and energy um, price expectations in aggregate inflation expectations can be explained by a simple model of sparsity-based rational inattention um, following um, the, the idea of rational inattention by Xavier Gabex. And in this model, really, consumers optimally choose to pay more attention to food and energy price inflation expectations because food and energy inflation expectations are just uh, the most volatile components of their consumption basket. And once I include this, this idea or this model of sparsity-based rational inattention expectations formation into a structural multi-sector new Keynesian model with rational inattention, um, it turns out that similar to the data, expected food and energy inflation um, are a key, um, are those categories to which households pay most of their attention. They become a key source of aggregate demand volatility. And for the central bank, um, this creates an incentive to put more stabilization efforts on the food and energy sector, on the non-core sector of the economy. And in a quantitative welfare analysis, 
of the model, I find that um, this increased uh, or this disproportionate household attention on food and energy prices is indeed sufficient um, for headline inflation targeting to be the welfare maximizing choice for monetary policy. So let me start by talking a bit about the, the survey uh, data that I collect. And this is part of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland's daily survey of consumers. I use data for roughly a year between July 2020 and July 2021. And um, it covers roughly 18,000 respondents that are, of course, representative of US consumers. And the data I, that I use is from a special survey module within that survey that I designed together with uh, Raphael Schönle, um, where households are asked about First, the headline inflation expectation, that is an expectation for, for aggregate price changes over the next 12 months, but also for category-specific inflation expectations. That is how they expect um, category-specific prices, for example, the price of a car or the price of gas, the price of food or so on, um, to change over the next 12 months. And crucially, those categories that the survey asks about cover the whole range of consumption expenditures of a typical US household. And in a similar pattern, the um, survey also elicits personal spending patterns of households. That is, it asks them how much money they spend in a typical month on a specific category. Um, and that allows me uh, to construct so-called expenditure rates that really um, give you an idea for each individual survey respondent, which fraction of his total expenditure he denotes to a specific category of consumption. That is, for example, how much he spends on, on food uh, and beverages in a, in a typical month. And using this data, the survey data, I can really estimate how sensitive aggregate inflation expectations of, us, uh, of, of um, survey participants of US consumers are um, to a specific category, say, for example, food prices or gas prices, relative to the expenditure rate. The expenditure rate, in a way, gives you um, an idea how important a specific category should be for aggregate inflation um, in an ideal world where everybody would behave consistently. Um, and this table below really shows you, um, by means of the bars, the estimated um, relative sensitivity of um, headline inflation relative to those consumption categories. And I think it's evident that um, it's really gas uh, and other energy goods and food and beverages that among the, um, those categories where um, inflation expectations of US households are most sensitive to. That is, um, I will interpret this um, in, the, in the model that I will show you in a minute, really uh, that households pay most attention to gas and energy price expectations in their formation of aggregate inflation expectations. If you compare that to other categories, uh, most of the core categories here, the sensitivity is much lower than for those two gray bars that, that give you um, the non-core um, components of the consumption basket. And I'm now giving you um, some intuition about this, this model of sparsity-based rational inattention expectations formation. Um, the basic idea is that the consumer wants to form um, an aggregate inflation expectation. That is a forecast about aggregate price level dynamics for the next uh, period, say the next 12 months. But he only has information about granular category-specific information about how individual prices or categories of prices might change in that period. And this is obviously an aggregation problem. You have to take this information about the category-specific price changes that you know from, say, your daily shopping experience and, or, and, and aggregate them up to your aggregate um, inflation forecast. Yet this is, of course, a very complicated mental problem as you have to think about a large number of different components of your consumption basket. And, um, so I'm proposing this idea that households might be inattentive to some components of their consumption basket when they think about aggregate inflation expectations and just rely on a subset of them. And as this equation shows you, um, the household could either pay attention to a specific category forecast, really use his um, category forecast for a specific category for the next 12 months to form his aggregate forecast, or the household could choose to not pay attention and just rely on some default expectation, say some long run trend inflation rate or the Fed's inflation target. Obviously, um, this default expectation um, is free of any mental cost um, because households do not pay attention. Um, this creates um, for, the, for the consumer an optimization problem as there is a trade-off. Of course, you want to pay as much attention as possible because that gives you a very informed, accurate forecast 
for aggregate price level dynamics over the next 12 months, what you actually want to have for your, say, intertemporal optimization decisions. At the same time, you want to limit your attention because attention is costly and there is a mental disutility from paying too much attention. And um, I then rely on the, um, the paper by Xavier Gabex to, to really find a solution for this optimal attention problem of households. And here it turns out that um, the optimal attention that a household pays to a specific component of his consumption basket increases in the volatility of inflation expectations in that specific um, consumption category. Um, think, for example, about gas prices. I know my gas prices are, price expectations are very volatile um, over time. They change a lot. So I choose to pay a lot of attention to, um, to my gas price inflation expectations because not paying attention um, would create a large inaccuracy cost. At the same time, not paying attention to think, for example, my healthcare price expectations might be um, not a big problem because my healthcare price expectation is very, very stable over time and very close to the default expectation. So um, I do not lose a lot of accuracy if I do not pay attention to those inflation expectations. Um, so I've now shown you some, some micro evidence um, from a consumer survey that for the US, um, US consumers' headline inflation expectations are actually most sensitive relative to expenditure shares to their non-core inflation expectations on a category level, their gas and food price expectations. And I can explain this by a model of rational inattention expectations formation, where households optimally choose to pay most of their attention to um, food and energy components of their consumption basket because inflation expectations are highly volatile in those categories. And in the paper, I also find some suggestive evidence on this mechanism. There's a strong positive correlation between the time series volatility for category-specific inflation expectations and the estimated um, attention that is this estimated sensitivity that I've shown you on the table before. Um, in the paper, I then use this idea of um, rational inattention expectations formation that I've just um, shown you intuitively and embedded into a um, multi-sector new Keynesian uh, general equilibrium framework that allows for monetary policy analysis. Um, except for this rational inattention in expectations formation, the model is fairly standard. It's a multi-sector extension of the canonical textbook model by Jordi Galli. And um, in the model, households will um, optimize intertemporally, so they have to form inflation expectations to decide on their optimization. And firms, of course, face some cargo pricing frictions, dependent on which sector they are located. And um, monetary policy in the model um, follows a very simple Taylor rule, but is able to define its own inflation target. That is, optimize welfare um, over the decision um, how much to react to which um, inflation rate. That is, how much to react to core inflation and how much to react to non-core inflation. And I then can analyze household welfare over that um, decision of of the central bank of monetary policy. In this figure, the horizontal axis gives you the inflation target rate that monetary policy chooses to place on non-core inflation. And um, the vertical axis gives you the welfare loss of households that is connected to that decision of, of the central bank. And if we look at the, um, at the red line, that gives really this model that accounts for this new micro evidence, the rational inattention model, that houses disproportionately focus on food and energy prices. Um, in this model, if the central bank chooses a headline inflation target at the very right of the figure, um, the welfare loss for households is smaller than in a situation where monetary policy chooses to only target core inflation. That is not adjust um, normal interest rates to um, any movements of food or energy price inflation. And, um, this, of course, tells us that um, in this type of model, once we account for this micro evidence of households, um, it is really superior for the central bank to target headline inflation. If I saw the model as a really as a standard multi-sector New Keynesian model without that rational inattention, I can replicate this earlier result from the literature that indeed targeting the core inflation rate is optimal. And really this difference in the policy implication from adding this new micro evidence on expectations formation that households pay a lot um, disproportionately more attention to food and energy price expectations in their inflation expectations formation is uh, comes from, from the fact that um, this disproportionate attention on food and energy makes those components really a key source of aggregate demand volatility. And this creates, of course, an incentive for the central bank 
to um, include them a bit more into the inflation target in order to stabilize real interest rate of households and thereby also stabilize aggregate demand, um, which in the end stabilizes um, the economy and um, reduces the welfare loss of households in this model. So let me conclude in my last minute. Um, in this paper, I um, construct and look at a new survey of inflation expectations in the US. Um, specifically, the survey um, is unique in that it looks at inflation expectations for a large, um, for the range of consumption categories of US households. And I provide new micro evidence that US consumers disproportionately pay attention to food and energy inflation forecasts um, in their expectations formation. And once I um, include that fact, that new micro evidence on expectations formation into a multi sector new Keynesian um, framework that is calibrated to the US economy, it turns out that headline inflation targeting is the optimal strategy um, for the central bank, very much in contrast to the earlier literature's focus on only targeting uh, the core inflation rate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um... All right, so our second speaker for today's webinar is Olivier Coibion, who is a professor of economics at University of Texas at Austin. Um, he will speak about inflation expectations and the misallocation of resources evidence from Italy. Yeah. Professor Coibion, whenever you're ready. Great, well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm gonna present joint work with Tiziano Ropelle and, and Yuri Gorodnichenko. Uh, this is kind of preliminary work. Uh, we haven't presented it before. And so it's gonna be on the, uh, the relationship between inflation expectations and, and the misallocation of resources. And uh, we, we do not speak for the Bank of Italy. All right, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, higher inflation. And, you know, of course, we're, we're all worried about uh, inflation being high. And, and, and there's a lot of discussion on, you know, the cost of inflation. But why is high inflation actually a problem? And in our standard models, uh, the main channel through which inflation is costly is that it leads to a greater dispersion in prices, right? And so if you have firms that are otherwise the same, they should be charging the same price. If they're charging different prices, some firms are going to be too big, some firms are going to be too small, there's going to be a misallocation of, of resources, and that's going to be uh, the source of the cost. And typically, in New Keynesian models, that price dispersion arises because of uh, price stickiness, right? So the idea is when inflation is high, those firms that get to change their price, they're going to change it by a lot relative to the much lower prices of the other firms that haven't changed their price. So the bigger is that gap, the more price dispersion there is, the more costly is, is inflation. The difficulty with this story is that the empirical evidence is not uh, super favorable uh, to this mechanism. So there, there's a well-known paper by Emmy Nakamura, John Steinson, and, and co-authors, where they look at the US in the 1970s, and they say, well, you know, when inflation was relatively high by US standards, we didn't really see any any larger price changes taking place than in uh, lower inflation periods, right? Which is kind of contrary to, to what you need for this cost of inflation to arise. And then in much higher inflation environments, like those studied in, uh, in a paper by Alvarez and co-authors, we see that prices become much more flexible. Uh, and so once the prices become much more flexible, then, then there's not going to be as much scope for this misallocation to arise as a result of price rigidities. So what we're going to be interested in today is a, a different source of price dispersion. And it's going to be the idea that even with flexible prices, price dispersion can arise if firms have different information sets that lead them to choose different prices, and that generates a misallocation of, of resources. So why would we think that there would be more disagreement uh, when inflation is high? Well, because we tend to see this in, in the data. So uh, Greg Mankiw, uh, Ricardo Reich, and Justin Wolfer showed this in 2004 in the U.S. that in periods with higher inflation, we tend to observe a lot more disagreement about inflation among households and, and professional forecasters. Uh, this is true also in the most recent episode in the case of firms. So I'll show you this using uh, the survey of firms inflation expectations, which is run by the, the Cleveland Fed. So here the black line is CPI inflation, right? Which we know went from relatively low levels, 2019, early 2020, 
to the much higher levels that, that we've been experiencing recently. As this has taken place, average expect, expectations of inflation have gone up quite a bit. But what's going to matter for us is along with that increase in the average expectations, we see a lot more disagreement, that's the red line, uh, among firms about future inflation. Right? So we see this increase in, in the differences in beliefs across firms as the level of inflation uh, goes up. And so what we're gonna be interested in in this paper is essentially asking, well, when you have more disagreement about inflation among these firms, does this actually lead to more misallocation of resources? And if so, how big is this channel? How much should we worry about the, the size of, of these effects? All right, so the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna to go to Italy. And in Italy, there's a survey of firms, uh, which is gonna allow us to measure the disagreement in the beliefs of these firms, there's gonna be a source of exogenous variation in that disagreement. And we can uh, connect the survey data to external information on the balance sheet of firms, which is gonna allow us to measure the misallocation of resources. So we can ask, when you have more disagreement about inflation, do you see more misallocation? All right, so we're gonna use this uh, survey of firms in Italy known as the, uh, the Survey on Inflation and Growth Expectations. And the survey has this really interesting property that starting in the third quarter of 2012, the Bank of Italy decided to randomly allocate firms in the survey to two different groups. And those two groups got a different inflation expectations question. All right, so prior to 2012 Q3, all of the firms were getting this second question here, which is in the last month, they would tell them CPI inflation in Italy was X percent and it was Y percent in the Euro area. What do you think it'll be in the next 12 months? Right, so everybody was getting this information about recent inflation. But then starting in the third quarter of 2012, these firms were split up and about one third of the firms were placed in this other group that we're gonna call the control group and they were just given this simpler question, just being asked, what do you think the inflation rate will be? So they were no longer provided with this information about recent inflation starting in 2012. And so what this does is it generates differences in beliefs among these firms, which arises uh, purely from which of these two groups they were randomly allocated to. And so it has a really big effect on, on their beliefs, which I'll, I'll illustrate kind of quickly. Uh, so, First, you know, let's go before this randomization takes place. Let's look in 2012, Q1. Okay, so we have two groups of firms. Ultimately, these, these firms are gonna be placed in the control and the treatment groups. But in the first quarter of 2012, they're all in the treatment group. They're all receiving the information. And so what you see here is the distribution of the expectations about inflation of these two groups of firms. And you can see they completely overlap, right? They're, they're, there's no differences in the information they're getting. But once the randomization takes place, we see really big differences that, that arise. So for example, if you look at the first quarter of 2014, the red line here shows the distribution of inflation expectations for firms in the treatment group, those that were told that inflation over the last 12 months was about a half percent. So you can see there's very little disagreement. Most of the firms have expectations that's very close to that number. Whereas in the control group, that's not provided that number, the average value is further away and there's a lot more disagreement uh, in their beliefs about inflation. And you can see this is happening pretty much in, in every quarter. So to show you the, the aggregate effect of this, this is the amount of disagreement amongst the control group, that's the, the black line, and the treatment group, the red line. All right, so prior to 2012, all the firms are getting the information. So their disagreement is tracking each other closely. And then once the information treatment begins, the amount of disagreement in the treatment group right, falls sharply relative to the disagreement in the control group. So you get this big difference in disagreement that arises, right, and that then varies over time as a result of the information that's being provided to just one of the two groups of firms. So that's the source of the, the disagreement about inflation that we observe. Right, so then we wanna ask, well, how does this affect the allocation of resources? And so here we're gonna follow Xi and Klinau very closely uh, using the fact that we can match the firms in the survey to external information on those firms. 
on their balance sheets, which allow us to measure their capital stocks, their value added, uh, the cost shares of different inputs. And so we can measure the marginal revenue products of capital, the marginal revenue products of labor for each of these firms. Okay, so then when we have them as a group for a given group of firms, we can say, well, when we observe differences in those marginal revenue products, that's a sign of misallocation, right? So we don't observe their prices directly, so we can't observe price dispersion, but we can observe the misallocation in terms of their inputs, okay? So we're gonna have different groups of firms, and then we're gonna look at the dispersion in these, uh, in these marginal revenue products as an indicator of the amount of misallocation. So then the empirical strategy is, is kind of simple given that, which is essentially we're gonna look at how the dispersion in these marginal products within a group of firms responds to the dispersion in their inflation expectations. Okay, and to be a little bit more precise, we're gonna look at the difference between the dispersion in the marginal products of the control groups relative to uh, the dispersion in the marginal products of the treatment group Right, and then we're going to compare it to the dispersion in their inflation expectations, again, comparing the control and the treatment group. So we're going to group firms into uh, different groups based on their area, their industry, and their size. And then we're going to run a bunch of local projections uh, to study the effect of disagreement on the misallocation at different time horizons. All right, and the, the, the punchline, to, to, to be quick, is that we're going to be able to very strongly reject the null that disagreement about inflation has no effect on misallocation, okay? So we can measure misallocation using the marginal revenue products of labor, of capital, the ratio of the two. In any case, we can say over these horizons, you know, we can reject that, that hypothesis, that disagreement about inflation doesn't do anything. Misallocation. In fact, we find that when disagreement goes up, we have more misallocation. So how big is this effect then? Should we think about this as, as a welfare cost of, of inflation? So in general, the the welfare losses that arrive from uh, this kind of misallocation. So it's gonna depend first on the amount of disagreement, which generates some misallocation. And then the cost of that misallocation is gonna depend on some parameters uh, like elasticity of substitution, labor share, price rigidity, uh, and so on. So we're gonna do a few exercises, a couple exercises where we pick some parameter values or a range of parameter values and ask you know, for a certain change in disagreement how does it affect, or how much does it affect welfare? All right, the first experiment we do is what we think of as, as a, a successful policy communication experiment, All right? So we start in Italy, we have these firms in the control group, they disagree quite a bit. And the thought experiment is suppose that policymakers were able to tell all the firms in the economy, the information that's provided to the firms in the treatment group. Right? That would reduce disagreement in the economy by about 30%. Right? That's the average dis difference in disagreement that we observe between these two groups. And the question is, if disagreement goes down by 30% in a pretty low inflation environment, how does that affect welfare? And the answer is not very much. Right? So welfare would increase because there'd be less disagreement and less misallocation. But in that low inflation environment, uh, the, the quantitatively, the effect is pretty small, 0.2 to 0.5%. So disagreement about inflation in a low inflation environment is not very costly. Now we can do another experiment, which is based on the recent period, right? So here we're going to say, okay, suppose inflation goes up from say 1% to 8%, and therefore disagreement rises a lot as it has in the data. Okay, and in Italy over this time period, disagreement went up by about a factor of four. So we can say, well, what happens to welfare when we increase disagreement by that amount? And the answer is welfare declines quite a bit. Right? So the welfare costs that we get are in the range of 2% to 7% as inflation goes from kind of this low number to a moderate number, which suggests that even moderate inflation can be pretty costly through this disagreement channel uh, that, that we're identifying here. So I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, you know, we observe in the data and historically that periods of higher inflation are periods where people disagree a lot more about the outlook of inflation. So what we show is that this disagreement about inflation translates into a greater misallocation of resources across firms. Okay, and this is, this is a cost of inflation that, we, that has not been studied uh, very much or quantified very much. 
So what, what we argue is that in normal times, that cost is not very large, but when you move from a low inflation to a medium inflation environment, the welfare cost there is, is pretty significant. So this is providing another rationale uh, for maintaining low and stable inflation. And the, the final thing I, I want to mention is it also suggests an interesting role for communication strategies in terms of mitigating these costs, right? So this, the source of this cost is that firms have these different beliefs about what inflation is going to be. And, you know, what the survey experiment indicates is even providing just a little bit of information to these firms can dramatically reduce the disagreement and therefore the cost of inflation uh, that we observe. And so better communication during these periods of higher inflation could go a long way potentially to offset some of these, these higher costs. So I'll, I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, so be before we get to the Q&A session, let me remind the uh, attendees that they can post their questions in the Q&A space if they have any. Um, so I'll get started with uh, with the questions. So this question is um, is for Alex. Um, so while gas prices are relatively homogeneous, might we uh, not even want to focus on a few products from a more disaggregated set of food and maybe other items? Um, so you uh, could you could you maybe repeat the question? I didn't. Sure. So while okay. while gas prices are relatively homogeneous, mm -hmm. um, might we not even want to focus on a few products from a more disaggregated set of food and maybe other items? Um, so in my, in my paper, I find that um, it's actually optimal for, for the central bank to really focus uh, or include um, both gas and energy, uh, gas and, and food prices into an inflation target because they play such a very important role of in, in household expectations. Of course, it might be the case that um, that households even go one level of disaggregation lower that they do not really care about food prices in general, but maybe about the price of milk or the price of, of meat because that's very salient and those are the prices that are most volatile to them. Um, in the survey right now, we I cannot really distinguish between that because I choose that um, level of disaggregation with those categories. But of course, um, it would be very interesting to go even a step further and, and ask them about really individual prices, um, as long as, as that might be feasible in terms of um, getting people to really answer the survey, um, as this might require a lot of questions. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, get to a question for Professor Koibion. Uh, can you be a bit more specific about through which channel the misallocation propagates? Does it go through the product market wedge or the labor market wedge? Yeah, so we 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 find uh, we find an effect on on both wedges. Um, yeah, so we there, there's we we can't identify like a specific one that seems to matter particularly. They're they're all responding. Uh, in terms of the welfare, we we have not we have not asked quantitatively which of them is is driving much of the most of the the action. So we could do that, kind of decompose that welfare welfare loss in terms of the the different uh, channels, but we haven't we haven't checked that. That would certainly be uh, something to do. What we can say is qualitatively, they're they're all responding. Um, but yeah, we'll ha I'll have to look into the the quantitative uh, relevance. Thank you. Um, let me turn uh, the question for another question for Alex. Besides central banks, would your findings also have implications for designing surveys and sampling efficiencies, efficiency for various products by statistical institutions? Um, they may sample with error is an explanation in, in brackets. Um, so this question, uh, as I understand this, is about really uh, the survey design. And um, Yes, of course, the, the idea of this, the survey is really to, to understand or get a more informative measure of, of inflation expectations, so, sim, somewhat similar to the way that um, statistical agencies form, form aggregate inflation statistics by asking households about the components and then aggregating them to, to aggregate inflation expectations. So very similar to, to what statistical agencies do um, is actually the, the spirit of, of this survey, I would say. Another question for Professor Koibion. Uh, are you surprised that firms in Italy don't appear to have tracked information on aggregate inflation 
In Italy and the euro area, as inflation rose, or does this just confirm the belief that firms don't follow aggregate inflation in spite of its behavior? Um, yeah, I, I think it, it confirms the, the previous evidence that firms are not very attentive to aggregate inflation overall. It's not a first order uh, factor when they're when they're making their decisions. They still respond to it when they change their beliefs about it, but it's it's not something that they they pay a lot of attention to. Now it seems to be the case that you know when the inflation rate goes up, people start to pay more attention. Uh, to it, and we do tend to, to see that in in the data. Uh, but even then, um, you know, they're, they're clearly not fully informed. Um, yeah. Let me turn it over to Alex. Have you considered adding additional targets, for example, measures of inflation expectations in the Taylor Rule? Um, so far, I haven't done that in the paper, but obviously, this is um, I think a very natural extension to to look at somewhat different inflation targets of monetary policy, for example, um, targeting inflation expectations explicitly um, or some some uh, stricter inflation targeting rules. Um, yes, so that's something I want to do for future research. Um, another question for Professor Koibion, what is the welfare consequence if all firms have the same but wrong inflation expectations? They all agree, but they're all wrong. Does it lead to less misallocation? Uh, that's 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 a that's a good question. So in in the framework that we're looking at, the costs are really just arising from the differences in the beliefs, not from the level of of the inflation itself. Um, so that that would be a different channel in where the average expectations are kind of off relative to the full information one. Um, and that's not one that we're that we can quantify here. Thank you. Um, so from the uh, Q and A session, I have um, we have a question for Alex. Does it matter why consumers pay more attention to certain products? Uh, for instance, whether because it's salient, since they have to pay more often, for instance, gas, milk, or because it's volatile. Um, so for, for the monetary policy exercise in my paper, it actually doesn't really matter if it's due to the volatility or if this is totally exogenous of the model, this level of attention. Um, the main policy result still holds true that um, once we account for this micro evidence that US consumers disproportionately pay attention to food and energy prices, um, it is optimal for the Federal Reserve to target headline inflation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm using... Um, really this argument of volatility that drives salience and attention in, in the model to really include that into the new Keynesian model. But there might, of course, be very different stories about expectations formation going on at the same time. For example, um, the frequency with which you, you pay for a certain product um, or with which you observe the price, yes. Thank you. Um, another question for Professor Koibion. About the role of communication, do you mean transparency? Uh, meaning central bank transparency, or do you mean another channel of communication? Um, no, I, I meant more providing information directly uh, to firms, information that they don't otherwise know, right? And so essentially the more public information is out there, the less disagreement there's going to be amongst these firms, right? Because they're going to be focusing on this, this public signal that they're that they're receiving, like you know the most recent uh, inflation rates. Um, that's that's what I mean. So when the firms are relying on you know whatever private information they have, you're going to get differences in beliefs. When you get them to focus more on on the publicly available information, uh, that disagreement will be smaller. And maybe I have a follow up question on that. Would it matter? Um, would it make a difference on whether the central bank is giving out information about, say, current realized inflation versus the target or a combination of the two? Um, that's a good question. In in practical terms, it you know from from the experimental evidence that that exists, it generally doesn't make much of a difference 
which of those two pieces of information is provided because firms in advanced economies tend not to be informed about really either one of them. And so both of them are gonna lead to kind of a convergence in, in beliefs. Um, you know, that, that can be different in, in different settings, however, depending on how informed firms are about, you know, say the inflation target versus uh, what the recent inflation rate has, has been. In that case, if there's a big difference in terms of how informed agents are about something, there's not gonna be much value in providing them with information about something they already know. Uh, then it's that it's going to be the, the, the providing information about what what they don't know that will help uh, kind of uh, bring the beliefs closer together. Thank you. Um, and maybe we can get to a final question for Alex. Um, this effect seems to rely on the expectations channel of spending. Would we, would we expect this effect to be much weaker in a Hank model in which the intertemporal channel is weaker? Um, but in in this model, um, I really actually rely on the on the expanding channel of uh, of households. But um, yes, if you go to a Hank model, um, it might be somewhat weaker as um, some groups of the population um, might not really um, have an, any intertemporal substitution. But you could also think about other extensions of the model. For example, adding wage bargaining and households bringing their um, basically their inattention to core inflation to, to wage bargaining, which might make uh, the channel even stronger. So. Um, yes, there might be interesting extensions of the model um, that might might change a bit uh, the quantitative effect here. And I think that I have touched on all of the questions. This was a very lively Q and A session. Thank you so much uh, to Alex and Professor Koibion for their great presentations and insights. And thanks to to everyone for participating, for attending, or uh, posing questions, um, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to register for our next Sibra uh, webinar, which will be in two weeks from, from today, February 23rd. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.